I'm good. All right. Hey guys, my name is Thomas Brush. I am the creator of a game called Pinstripe and also a game called Once Upon a Coma. Both games are highly acclaimed indie games. Um, it sort of gives me a little bit of credibility about why I'm talking about indie games. Um, so without further ado, I have one of the coolest um, indie developers with me, and he's actually running an indie studio. Um, and I, I feel terrible about this, Z, because I've been calling you Z for so long, and you just told me how to say your full name. Do you want to introduce yourself and tell people how to say your full name? Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Uh, so my, the, I, I guess the the Americanized pronunciation of my name is Jinghua Yang, and uh, but but it's it's just way too long. I'm way too Chinese for for anyone <laughs> to. Yeah, I love that. So what do you do, man? Yeah, so so yeah, I'm. Uh, Typically, people call me Z. I run a video game studio here in Colorado called Serenity Forge. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, our, our team is 17 people now. Uh, can you believe it? It's kind of, kind of crazy. Holy crap, yeah. really? Yeah, it's, uh, it's been growing uh, pretty, pretty <laughs> Wait, quick. Wait, did you, did, you did you just say 17 people? Yeah, 17, full-time. I Dude, okay, so just full disclosure, everybody. Me and Z, um, Z is, is the publisher of Once Upon a Coma. He's the owner of Serenity Forge. And so just putting that out there. And Z, dude, like we've been working on Once Upon a Coma for almost like two years now, maybe even more. And I did not know that there were 17 people working for you. Yeah. Like, well, that's huge. Yeah. When we first started, I think it was like less than, it was like less than eight is when we first started talking. And now, yeah, yeah it's been, it's been growing. It's been kind of crazy. Uh, you, you know how like, um, I, well, I don't know if you ever had this situation before because you kind of uh, mostly fly solo with your projects. Yeah. But, but like uh, I remember when our team got to like nine people and I remember yeah. like walking out of the office and I was like, I have no idea what this guy in the corner did all day. <laughs> like no clue what this guy did. Uh, nowadays well, yeah. is like a, nowadays is like a common occurrence. I don't know what the fuck half of the company does all day. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's there's a ton of stuff that I want to bring up in this conversation because you are you are an anomaly in the game industry because the game industry, you know, it, I mean, there's tons of wonderful people out there in the game industry, but there's a lot of terrible companies and they just crank, st like they hire people, get, you know, work them like they're animals and then they fire them, you know, to get things done and, and just get a bunch of projects done. And from what I've learned about your company is you treat your employees with you let them like come and go as they please essentially um just as long as they're working hard and they get projects done uh yeah i mean there's uh there's definitely a few like unique things that we do here at serenity yeah. Forge. first of all uh everyone is like full time and they they don't just work on one thing you know uh because I, I think a lot of game companies like they would come up with an idea get the funding and then they go around and you know bring on a bunch of contractors and once they're done they let them go uh, right. For us, uh, when we hire, we hire them like for life, essentially, so that That's when so they're cool. on this project, they're they're working on it. Once they're done, they're going to be jumping on another project, or someone could be working on like three different projects at the same time, doing various different tasks. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And also, like you said, uh, we don't count vacation days. We don't count sick days. Uh, you just get paid a monthly salary, whether or not you show <laughs> up, as long as you get yourself done. And you know, it's apparent, like when you're not. When someone is like low, low performing, it's it's obvious. Like people can tell, and yeah. you know when that actually happens, then that's a conversation we have to have to see what's going on outside of work and all that. Right. But ultimately, we trust each other, so it shouldn't it shouldn't be a big uh, problem. Well, I've got a, a a really interesting question for you, and I think it's going to be the title of this podcast. But first, before I ask you that really awesome, wonderful question, I'm going to keep people hanging and we're going to do the tradition of this podcast. Now you, I, you brought your, uh, drink, correct? Yes. Yes, I did. Okay. So usually with this podcast, um, we'll drink beer together. Um, but Z is one of those amazing people who doesn't drink beer. And I think that's honestly really admirable. I don't actually know why you do that. But you did bring something to the show. What, what did you bring? Yeah, so I mean, I can go into it forever because I'm a tea fanatic. But uh, so, <laughs> so I brought this uh, new tea that came out uh, this year. Uh, fr uh, it was from China, uh, shipped here uh, by one of my family members. Uh, the Chinese okay. pronunciation of the tea is called the Ju Duozai, which is, uh, I Whoa. guess, yeah, I guess it roughly <laughs> translates um, 
kind of roughly translates to apricot kernel fragrance. It, I think is the best way to translate okay. it. Um, it's that an, sounds delicious. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's an oolong tea that came from a town in uh, China called the uh, uh, Fenghuang, which is oh, it translates to Phoenix. Uh, it came from Phoenix County in the Hunan province. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it has a very unique aroma. Um, it's very uh, weighty and uh, almost okay. kind of nutty in a lot of ways. Uh, and it's yeah. won multiple prizes, top ten teas right now in China. It's just very, uh, very high, have, uh, you know, highly regarded. It's something that I've been enjoying for a while now. Dude, that is so impressive that you just said all those cool words. <laughs> um, I love that. I love like whenever people speak, um, it's Mandarin. You call it Mandarin, not Chinese, right? Mandarin. Yeah, yeah, Mandarin. Um, whenever people speak Mandarin, I, I automatically go, that person is a genius. <laughs> it just sounds, it sounds so smart and so succinct. So congratulations on that. It's beautiful. Yeah, thanks, man. It's, <laughs> my, it's still my native language. I mean, I grew up speaking yeah. uh, Mandarin. I was born in China. See, I, I never really asked you that question all these years. I didn't really ask you if you were natively born in China. Yeah, no. Um, okay, that's awesome. Well, okay, um, I brought tea as well to be... Um, to sort of drink tea together. But in my case, I got Evan Williams cheap whiskey from Costco and I'm going to pour <laughs> it in my tea. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. So, dude, how do you say cheers uh, in Mandarin? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, gambe. Gambe? Mm -hmm. All right, dude. Gambe. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> cheers. All right, let's get talking. So the question I have for you, Z, is when does a studio get big enough to not be called an indie studio? Uh, that's a, that's a really loaded question. <laughs> um, so Cause I would consider you guys an indie studio. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually think it's not necessarily the size, but I think a lot of times it's like source of funding. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and also just culture. Uh, you can have, yeah. you can have like a three person team. And if this team is, you know, backed by venture capitalists and, you know, investors, um, and, and, you know, started by someone who's, uh, very renowned in the industry. Uh, and you know, that, that might be just like a, like a legit company and not necessarily a startup. Um, right, I, I've, exactly. yeah, I've seen, I've seen like, there are a couple games out there, uh, that it's really, it's kind of tough to consider them as indie, uh, yeah. like, like, Which uh, ones? uh, so killing floor. Um, yeah, yeah. Killing, I don't know if you heard about them. It's, uh, by a company called tripwire interactive. They were like, you know, less than 10 people at one point before they made Killing Floor. They were just 100% bootstrapped, no investors. Uh, but then, you you know, you look at their games and it's like, holy shit, like they, they make some pretty crazy stuff. Uh, right. Same with Avon Colony, uh, which is uh, developed by Paul Tozor, who is a good friend of mine. Uh, his team is three people, but they're making this game that looks like SimCity. And uh, he, <laughs> he was the AI director behind all the Metroid Prime games and he worked at Rare. Okay. You know, it's just like a lot of times... Uh, it, it's 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 kind of like a thin line, so I think yeah. Um, yeah I think it has to do with the team culture, right? Uh, if yeah. you're making a game that you really believe, um, versus you're making a game to try to generate your annual margins, uh, I think that's probably what really defines what an indie is. Okay, yeah I uh, I'm going through this phase where I'm getting kind of pissed off with the constant use of the term indie game uh, because it's becoming more like I I just scrolled through the Nintendo Switch store. Um, and it's just, it's slowly becoming more and more loaded with indie games, which is amazing. Like, that's awesome. Um, but there's like, I don't know if I'm right here. I could be completely way off base, but it seems like there's way more indie games than regular games on the Switch store. And it just seems like game, like indie games are like just normal games now. Like in the nineties, you wouldn't call Super Mario an indie game, but it, it, behaves as an indie game like if you play it now it feels like an indie game um so i don't know like it, the whole idea of games being independent um I, th I just wish we had a different word um maybe just small games I, I but then again they're not all small games you know in my case my games are small um but I think I think it's just become an overused term, and I don't know if it's very descriptive. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I I fully understand. It's uh, I I firmly believe, and I try to not use the word indie uh, altogether uh, within the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually stopped. Yeah, I'm starting to do that. Yeah, I stopped defining Serenity Forge as an indie studio about like two years ago, and I think okay. it really helped us uh, in like just placing ourselves in the industry. 
then people yeah. see us more as more of, of a company, um, as a as a startup, you know, uh, as someone who is here to create products and also you know find solutions for real world uh, needs and all that. So so yeah. I don't know. It, for us, it definitely helped. For me, it helped with my personal identity. Uh, you know, I can okay. I can still define myself as an indie game dev just because I have been like I, I was a freshman in college making my own you know solo games before, so I can kind of like understand what that feels. But yeah. unless if you're in that scenario, unless if you're a college kid, you know, making games in your basement, I really don't feel like indie is, is a, a, an appropriate term for yeah. uh, anything. Well, I mean, it's like if, you, if you're if you not a, a regular consumer of indie games, whenever you hear that term, you're going to think, okay, so this game is artsy, um, it's silly, it's short, and like maybe it's something maybe pixel art. Pixel art is con- like you constantly see that in indie games. And that's right. just not the case with a lot of these these new indie games coming out. Yeah. They're just games that are in smaller in scale. And I think that's really, really special with quote unquote indie games. I think what makes them really special is because they're so low budget, because they're such a small scale, they got to, the developers got to make sure that the gameplay mechanics and the hook of the game is perfect and really, really special. Otherwise you've just got a mediocre game altogether. Right. So there's, there's a focus on gameplay um, and you, making unique things like it, didn't the whole concept for Portal start as an indie game or at least an indie idea? Yeah, it started with a really small team, and then they took that really legit like diamond uh, in the rough concept and turned it into this triple A title. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I yeah. would almost argue that uh, the difference between an indie studio versus a non-indie studio is whether or not you care about your business outcome. Like if you're if yeah. you're releasing your game and you don't care whether or not it makes any money at all, then I would say you're <laughs> an indie developer. Otherwise, you're That's not. That's hilarious. Yeah. Well, you, I think indie developers to remain sane need to have that um, posture. Yeah. Because otherwise, like for me, like when I when I launched Pinstripe last year, it was like the hardest month of my life. It was insane because I had I didn't have expectations. Like I didn't think I'm gonna make a million bucks, but I had this subconscious feeling that, please God, I hope I make some money here, Mm -hmm. you know? And I think that indie developers need to, they're almost required mentally and emotionally to make games just because they love them. Because like you said, you just don't know how how it's going to do. Well, yeah, I mean, it kind of like the whole spirit of indie is to create art, right? In a way, create something that makes people think or something like that. So if you are yeah. doing that, but then when you're releasing the game, you start thinking about, oh, would my game make money? Well, the problem yeah. is you never intended to make money while you're making that game. Why are you <laughs> like, right. you know, why are you slapping that cri- new criteria for success on something yeah. that you didn't do during the past, you know, four or five years of making your game? So I feel like what, there's an identity crisis for a lot of these indie developers through that. I think so. I think so. And you know, dude, I'm just gonna say it. I hate hanging out on Facebook and seeing all the <laughs> all the all the stupid memes about I'm an indie developer and I made ten dollars a month, that kind of stuff. I think it's really damaging to the indie let's I just want to stop saying indie, but I don't know what else to say, but it's damaging to the indie mentality. Right. Um, because it starts turning it into woe is me, I'm a exhausted indie developer who's not making any money. Um, when in reality we should be we should be posting celebratory posts about how fun it is and how lucky we are that we get to even make games like this this whole concept of sitting in your garage which i'm in my garage right now and making games that would have was never really a thing i mean maybe it was for like rareware when they were making banjo kazooie but like that really wasn't a thing in the triple a industry in like the 90s and the early 2000s like this is the coolest job in the world so i don't want to complain about how much money i'm making or or whatever and i'm certainly guilty of that but seeing these memes on Facebook, it's just kind of frustrating. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I mean, I, I know exactly what you mean. Those uh, like indie game promo groups or yeah. whatever. Yeah. yeah. So, so Which I'm a part of and I want to be a part of them. But I also want to encourage them to be more positive. Right. Yeah. You know? so, so like what I've personally found is I mean, I'm, I'm kind of split. Like I, I completely agree with you. Um, but at the same time, I want to just take a quick step back and look at the, I, I guess I, the best way to say it is like the socioeconomic situation right of these game developers um and i I think it's kind of crazy if you look at these people making these posts they're usually like 
you know, non-American, sometimes not even uh, European, right? Like they're, yes, they're Asian, I, yep. South American, African, you know, like a Middle Eastern, like tons of different descents. Um, and, That's awesome. And it, yeah, it's like, it's really cool that these people are uh, going on Facebook, making fun of their own careers and, you know, actually making yeah. video games. Like imagine this, yeah. but like 30 years ago or the tw- even 20 years ago. It's like yeah. it would never happen for anyone from like China or something like that because uh, they just don't have true. that resource. So a, a part yeah. of me, I would say that I'm really glad that our industry has evolved so much and the barrier of entry is so low that anyone, yeah. like literally anyone, middle schoolers, high schoolers can pick up Unity and start making their own games and start, you know, like identif- identifying themselves as a game developer. And that, that to me, like that's the positive side of looking at this. Well, let's uh, let's let's let's. Um... This is relevant politically, but we're not going to get into politics, I promise. But let's talk about borders, right? Mm-hmm. So do you think that Steam should have borders? Should, should game um, platforms have borders or barriers of entry? What do you think about that? So, so I know uh, my, my, idea, my, kind of my thought on what Steam's been doing for the past couple of years, uh, kind of flip-flop with, with every decision they make. Yeah. Uh, so I remember <laughs> when, the, when Greenlight... Uh, first got shut down and uh, the hundred dollar like the hundred dollar copay to get into a uh, yeah. steam thing came up uh, i remember hating that like i absolutely hated it because because <laughs> like when steam uh, when Greenlight first happened for for game developers that's like oh cool now i have a doorway to like actually show off my game it's being voted on so it's like right. curated people actually want these games it seemed like it made sense, or at least made some sense at the time. I can't speak for like larger studios, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the hundred dollar copay happened, um, and then now it just became an, the App Store, right? Uh, and it's literally the same as the App Store, only on PC. And and we all know how the App Store didn't do very well, uh, or at least yeah. it's not great for developers in, in general. It's it's not good at all. Like yeah. if anybody's ever released a game on the App Store. They know how little money you actually make. Yeah. I made zero dollars, and I released a game on the App Store, and that's fine. I'm not like I'm not gonna be a hypocrite here and complain about it. But it's it's tough because you're right. It's just so crowded. Um, yeah. And like, but their their barrier of entry was completely void. They didn't have one, right? Yeah. I mean, you could say that the entire mobile game uh, industry was shaped by how that economic. Uh, that financial model was structured by Apple, yeah. right, and and yeah. kind of how crowded and how just how shitty it ended up becoming. Um, <laughs> but but then, so so you know how recently uh, Steam announced that now they're like okaying like adult games as well, and just pretty much anything goes on Steam. Yeah, and yeah. and when I saw that, I was actually kind of excited for that. Um, you know, like <laughs> I mean, there's there's the, the the segment of obviously now gamers can play adult games on Steam, and yeah. that, that's like you know beneficial. You to, sounds so excited to about a lot that, of different Z. different uh, yeah right uh, <laughs> to different degrees. But to me, that actually means that Steam is even more accessible than the App Store, which is kind yeah. of crazy to think about because we always assume App Store is the most accessible thing that's out there. Yeah. Um. So with that, I actually uh, what I realized is that Steam doesn't want to. I mean, it's obvious that they didn't want to do this, but. Uh, they don't want to do curation at all. They're just purely a platform. Um, it's the same mm-hmm. as something like GameJaw or Itch, where anyone can be on there, and there's absolutely no criteria to be on Steam, um, yeah. which means that curation, they're just, essentially, this is their way of handing off curation to other third parties. And you can start to see, right, like YouTubers and streamers, the reason why this this whole phenomenon in the past few years about their, uh, you know, them getting bigger is because Steam is handing off curation to other people. Uh, so, you know, I think it's a, it's a giant shift in, in the industry and I'm kind of excited to see what's going to happen. Yeah. But I'm not super sold still on how YouTubers and streamers currently work in that f- right, sphere. Right, exactly. Well, have you, have any of your studio's games suffered at the hands of the overcrowded system? Uh, I mean, it's hard to tell, right? Uh, I could yeah. say that every game suffered. <laughs> you know yeah, what? It probably did. Yeah. Uh, but Except you, for Hollow Knight. Yeah, but, Hollow Knight didn't suffer. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I mean, well, it's, it's hard to say. Like, you know, people who yeah, play... It's just doing so well, dude. Even on, on Switch, Hollow Knight is killing it. Right. Um, but you could also say that our games only exist because of the capitalism that goes into uh, the game industry right now, right? Yeah. Um, if it wasn't yeah. for Steam being so open then there's not going to be as many gamers in the world. Therefore, you have a smaller amount of uh, you know, audience to sell to. So maybe we hmm. end up selling less. Uh, so it, it is kind of hard to tell, I think. Um, it, it, I would be lying if I said I knew an actual answer to that question. Yeah. I don't know, dude. I have no idea. I 
part of me selfishly wants these massive barriers of entry, you know, like a thousand dollars to get in, get your game into the store, just so there's less competition. But then again, comp like a ton of competition doesn't mean that nobody's going to rise to the top. You know, like there, if your game is great, it will probably rise to the top uh, in Steam. Uh, but that does mean that there, I mean, it feels almost like America, like there, there is no middle class. It's just you either failed big or you, you did really well. I mean, that, I could be completely wrong there. Um, in the case of Pinstripe, it was probably in the middle. Um, like it did pretty good and it's still doing pretty good, but it's certainly, I've heard a lot of stories about how either you make very little money or you make a lot, you know, it's very polarized. Right. And I, I think it's going to become more like that too, especially with steam just opening up like that until, until yeah. we get curation, uh, you know, until someone steps in and really takes care of curation, but until then, yeah. you know, well then, you know, back to your original point, uh, part of your philosophy is that you don't really care about any of this because you just want to make great games, right? Um, so, so this is, uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and dive into a, like a little bit of, uh, uh, maybe, maybe an issue that I see with the game industry and people getting into okay. uh, uh, game dis uh, development. Um, yeah. you know, whenever I talk to other game developers, I feel like 90% of the time they fall into one of two buckets. They are either, uh, designing a game and developing a game that they really want to play so that they, you know, start making that game, which is, you yeah. know, a, a pretty, pretty large majority. Wouldn't it be cool if this game was like that, you know? Um, right. And then the other bucket I see is uh, a lot of people who are just making a game that they think is going to be the next big thing so that they can make a lot of money off of it, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, I'm going to make League of Legends, but better, you know, the next League of Legends, <laughs> uh, the next blockchain game or like whatever it may be, right? It's, it's, it's one of these two buckets. Uh, yeah. I feel like for our, in our perspective, at least the way I see it, I always try to look at these buckets as tools to achieve what we really want to do. So my yeah. criteria for making games is always, I don't necessarily want to make a game that I really want to play sometimes. I, I don't really wa want to make a game that makes a lot of money sometimes. Both of which are important and they're pillars for why we decide things. Uh, but yeah. the ultimate goal is how much value we're actually creating for society. It's like, if I make this game, and imagine a scenario where a million people plays this game overnight. How is the world going to change if, if that wow. happens, right? And, that is such a crazy thought. Well, yeah. I never even thought that way. Well, well <laughs> you got to think about it. As game designers, as game yeah. developers, we have this inherent duty to shape our future. Kids play yeah. games way more so. I mean, kids play games and watch people play games way more so than they watch TV or read books or watch movies anymore. Yeah. Um, so we are you know, directly affecting what the world is going to be like. Uh, years crazy. down the road. I mean, you, you you just became a dad. You understand that, you know? Like, oh, yeah. You know, we have that kind of just a responsibility. You're like shaping yeah. a whole generation right now with game yeah. design. Dude, my daughter is already addicted to the television. Oh, right oh no. And I just said television like I'm an old person. <laughs> television yeah. as opposed to TV. Um, but she's addicted to TV. And uh, I, it's my fault too because, you know, she's screaming her head off and I don't know what's wrong. So I'll just turn on baby Einstein stick her in a rocker and I'm like, Oh, she's happy now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it, you're totally right. Um, people, especially people like me and whoever else has kids and who are making games, we do have a responsibility to make it. They don't have to be like necessarily like, I don't know exactly what you're trying to say, but I think I understand what you're saying is they, they make a positive impact. That doesn't mean that, you know, there's no swearing or whatever. It just means yep. that it's trying to, convey a message that is positive and good for for America and the world. Um, and I see that in your work. Now, my question for you is, this is something that I've been wanting to talk to you about since I met you, um, and it's, it's just a beautiful subject. You, people, a lot of people may know this, but some of the listeners might not know this, but you did something that is probably on anyone's bucket list, anyone who wants to be you know, successful in their life. You, you pulled it off. You did a Ted talk. Um, and I want to hear more about that story because this is why that what you mentioned in your Ted talk, this is why you want to make games that are meaningful because games, uh, from what I have heard, you were almost dying. You were almost dead and games saved your life. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty well-known story nowadays because uh, I talk yeah. about it a lot. But uh, so what happened is throughout like middle school and high school, um, 
I was I was very overweight. I was you know 200 250 pounds. Uh, oh, I was dude. yeah no I was uh, I played tons of video games. I would play games up until like you know five or six o'clock in the morning, and then like you know jump into bed before my mom comes into my room to try to wake me up, and then <laughs> and then I'll wake up and then go to school and then just like fall asleep during class. And you know I didn't I I, wow. I did terribly at school. I didn't have any friends in school because I was just spending so much time playing games. Um, yeah. And it was really bad for me. Um, I, I had a huge addiction issue. Um, and what Man. what happened is, you know, I moved out of my house for college. And uh, within the first couple months of college, obviously, I'd completely like, you know, uh, destroyed my body, <laughs> essentially playing video Man. games. Um, and uh, and within two months of school, I was uh, I was diagnosed with a severe, uh, severe uh, illness. What, what was it called, uh, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very severe form of, uh, uh, the short version is called ITP, but the, the full name is Chronic Refractory Idiopathic Thrombocytopenic Purpura, uh, which basically just means that uh, my body believes that all of my platelets in my body are, uh, are harmful germs, so my <sighs> immune system kills all the platelets in my body, so Man. I just bleed all the time, and nothing there's nothing oh. in my blood that can stop um, and transfusions don't work either because as soon as the transfusion enters my body, my immune system kills the platelets. So it's just see, that's crazy, man. <laughs> I'm so sorry about like so sorry he had to go through that. Yeah, that's yeah. I mean, it's it's all right. Uh, it, thankfully, it doesn't like I don't feel anything. It's just uh, it it okay. was a uh, it was a really scary experience because. Uh, but you're still fighting that. Yeah, I still have it. Uh, I actually got a lot better uh, recently. My blood tests came back, and I for the first time in my life. I was within, like, actually, like, barely made it to the normal range, like, the healthy range, uh, which was crazy. Uh, that, uh, that, that was uh, phenomenal earlier this year. You're a miracle, dude. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, and, uh, but, yeah, I mean, that, that, that was kind of, like, the main thing that happened to me, and uh, I was hospitalized for two years. Uh, so, on Halloween night of uh, 2008, I was told I was going to die in three hours, uh, and that was right after I was admitted to the hospital. Um, I what? was, yeah, miles away from <sighs> home. Man. I was in Illinois when my parents were in Colorado. I called them that night when the nurse came in and gave me my will to fill out. Uh, and my parents Z, went. Oh my yeah. goodness. <laughs> Can't, I'm, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm just, I'm, I, I want to know how you felt. Like how did, no, so many of us are so like, I'm so lucky. Like my life is pretty good. I, I haven't really had anything bad happen. Um, and I'm just, I'm just lucky and I'm blessed and, and I hope that it stays that way. I just want to know, like, how does that feel to be told that you're going to die? You know, that what did I you think, feel like I, I recall that moment being extremely well, it was a very memorable moment. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. I bet. Um, but the, the, the one thing that really surprised me looking back at it is uh, when the nurse came in to tell me that I was going to die, I felt fine. I felt OK with that. I was actually very oh, content dude. with that idea. Um, and I was like, okay, yeah, I guess, I guess so. That's fine. I mean, like, it's not like yeah. I'm gonna feel pain or anything. Um, but then, like, maybe within a couple of seconds afterwards, my mind jumped into like the consequences of my death, and then I realized my parents, my, uh, you know, uh, people like Kevin. So Kevin and I are actually high school friends. Uh, like, you know, uh, explain people who, who Kevin is. Huh? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you sure, tell sure. Uh, Kevin <laughs> is uh, our uh, one of the co-founders of the yeah. company. He. Uh, you know, started the company with me essentially, yeah. and uh, we've been working together on games since we were in high yeah. school. So he's uh, an incredible guy. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Um, yeah. And he's still here. So uh, anyway, so like I thought about my family and all the people that cared about me, and I just realized about I just realized like what I did to them. You know, like they spent so many years, they put so much of themselves into loving me and caring about me for so many years, um, and now like due to my choices of not taking care of myself. I'm essentially robbing my parents of their child, right? And dude, that's a totally selfless way to think about well, it. I'm really impressed. I would be thinking that way. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, like, I I cared about them, you know. I I, I thought yeah. about them, and I thought about how I, I, you know, way like I'm I'm taking me away from them, and that how painful that must be for them. So that's when I started actually crying. Like, you know, I sat there and cried for a pretty long time. I called my parents, uh, told them I'm going to die in three hours. They jumped in a car, uh, you know, halfway during work and just started driving from Colorado, hoping that they could make it. But obviously, they oh wouldn't be able goodness. to. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, <sighs> it was uh, it was a pretty crazy moment. There, here's another cool, uh, fun, small tidbit. And that was uh, I was watching The Shining at the time. 
Uh, That's my favorite movie. Oh, or really? One of my favorite movies. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I used to have a big poster of that. That that movie is awesome, dude. Yeah, I never watched it before. I always knew it was a good one. So <laughs> it's I, a weird movie to watch when you're yeah. when you're dying. On your deathbed. Yeah, I was. <laughs> I, I remember being my deathbed. I was like, oh, at least I get to watch you know this really renowned movie before I die. It's like, I, maybe I'll make it to the end. You know. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, oh, that man. movie's awesome though. Yeah. So what's what you had a point there? Yeah, so about watching The Shining. Oh no, it's it's just a funny tidbit. <laughs> it's just yeah. Like I thought it was kind of <laughs> kind of weird. Like it's not something yeah. that you really like tell people when you're talking about a story like this. But that that was like to see me, that would be a really cool TED talk. The Shining saved my life. <laughs> I don't, okay, I don't know about that, but yeah. <laughs> um, but but that movie does hold a special place in my heart because of it. Cool. Well, dude, that's amazing. And and so how did you? Well, first off, I want to ask you this, like, really quickly, and then we can move on to how video games saved your life. Um, do you really think that it was your fault that you got sick? I don't know. Um, so my illness is actually the first case in the world. Uh, there hasn't been a case before. What? Uh, there was a whole research paper, if you, like, look up my illness, uh, that's published in 2010. That was regarding my case. Um, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, but I, I really don't know. I, I think I probably could have taken care of myself better. But the truth is, I was just some teenager, you know. Uh, what could I have known yeah. different? Um, so I don't really blame myself in that. I don't blame my parents. Good. I don't blame anyone. Uh, I think it was just bound to happen. And honestly, looking back at it, I'm really happy it did. Because uh, without this illness, I don't think I would be who I am today. Yeah, dude. No way. Like, um, I mean, I can't. The reason why I signed with you guys like immediately, like we were, I, well, it wasn't immediate. We we talked about some other projects, but when we talked about Once Upon a Coma, I signed with you immediately because I get this sense when I hear you talk that you've almost like this sounds really like a more of like an Eastern religion type thing, but you've almost like elevated yourself in a way above people your age because you're a young guy, but you talk in a way that's like you're 45, 50 years old, or I mean, so, so many 50 year olds don't talk the way you talk, which is this mentality that what you do has an impact on the people around you. Um, and so often I get caught up on how I can achieve stuff for myself, especially with like making games. Like sometimes it's even 80% of the time that I'm working on a game. I'm thinking, okay, how do I make this game great so that it benefits me? And you're thinking completely the opposite. You're thinking because of all that shit that went down in, uh, with, with your sickness, suddenly you're thinking, how do I make a game that helps people maybe that were in a situation that I was in or something where someone is suffering maybe, how do I make a game that helps them? And you did that, right? You made a, a game called, um, what was that called? L Loving Life? Loving Life, that's right. Uh, okay. So right after I got out of the hospital, so, so eventually I recovered, to kind of close off the story here. Um, mm -hmm. I recovered in the next two years uh, due to a still unknown reasons. Uh, they ended up actually taking me off of all medication because uh, nothing was working. So they just told me to go home and wait it out. And, yeah. uh, and I started recovering as soon as I started moving. Uh, so I moved home. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, so great. yeah, I, I was able to eventually transfer back into college uh, and start my freshman year in Colorado. And wow. I remember my, it's my first semester of college. I looked back and I was like, hey, you know, like, why don't I make video games to, to help other people? And uh, the first game that I made was a visual novel called Loving Life. Uh, it's free to download. Uh, and I released yeah. it online just, just as a tool almost to help other people or like as a way for me yeah. to kind of conclude my story. Um, <laughs> and it was, uh, it was just a non-fictional story about uh, how I, how I, uh, what I went through. So, yeah, so you, you're kind of one of those guys that uses video games as often as you can to communicate how you're feeling, I think, because didn't you ask your wife to marry you with a video game? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's, that's uh, so cool, man. You totally got, you totally beat me there. I just, I just asked my wife to marry me. That's, <laughs> I just got on one knee, but you did it in a video game. Yeah. It's, uh, I, I spent, I spent some time making her an RPG where, uh, you know, we ended up uh, well, I, I put like every single scenario that were really like memorable to me in the in mm -hmm. the game, so that she could walk through, I, essentially like walk in my shoes and kind of see the other side of the story, like what I was feeling in those moments, uh, yeah. and then like you know kind of show her the big picture. <laughs> That's so cool. Well, um, not to downplay any of this amazing, like I love talking about the emotional side of video games, but I want to get into how much time do you got, dude? Because let's see here. It's 430 over here. Do you have about 
20 minutes, 30 minutes to talk or? Yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Well, let's go 30 more minutes and then we can get into the, the cheat codes section of the game, which is the three secrets. But um, maybe 20, 30 minutes of just chatting about what I want to talk about is more of the business side of things because you run your indie studio, not indie studio. We, we can't use that word anymore. Um, <laughs> your video game studio is different than say the double fines of the world um, because, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you take on client work um, that's just to, just to help fund these indie games. Am I correct about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, let me let me clarify. Uh, you know, we're not we're, we're we're different from them, not because we <laughs> a lot of this is like not because we really wanted to, but I I honestly I actually blame myself for just being too stupid uh, to to <laughs> to like be like you know how like a lot of like game companies would go out there and seek funding and then uh, you know yeah. get investors. Now they have like five million dollars to invest in other games. A lot <laughs> yeah, of yeah, but they only have seventy like, percent of their company. You know? Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's it's true. But at the same time, like they, they have a lot to work with. For yeah. us, I just I just hate that feeling. I don't like I don't like losing control over you know yeah. like what the vision is in the company. Like I I I don't like having to go out there and you know make a fake pitch to some investor, some rich person who knows nothing about games <laughs> and make pro- fake promises that I'll give them double returns or whatever. And well, then the, the, the irony of this, the irony, irony of this is that I did that to you. <laughs> is, <laughs> I pitched my game once upon a coma to you. I think you just like control and power. Am I right about that? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say power necessarily. Cause if I wanted power, I would have stayed at the federal reserve. Yeah. Uh, but, but you know, <laughs> when it, when it comes to, when it, I guess when it comes to just like stuff that I'm really passionate for, I want to be able to, uh, have the correct message and I feel like if yeah. we have investors and I'm going around lying to them and then lying to the people I'm giving the money to uh, I, I just don't feel good about myself this way I know right. that if I fail in the investment uh, you know if I if put some money into a game that we end up publishing and then the game fails it's I don't have to answer to a lie that I told to someone else later I all I have right. to answer to is myself and my inability to make the right choices and in a way, you know, you, it's not as scary of a thing to to make a bad investment because you guys also have this backup plan of, of doing client work. Am mm-hmm. I right? Yeah, I have I have tons of backup plans. Uh, it's it's very <laughs> rare for Serenity Forge to ever go through anything dangerous. Um, I mean, we've been working together yeah. for a while now, and uh, you can kind of see that. And I don't know, dude. I sometimes like I the the cool thing is is that you guys you guys lend me your staff to help make my game. <laughs> and to me, to me, that is a huge risk. Cause it's like, well, I'll give you one of my staff members and you can, he can help you make this game that we don't even know if it's going to do well, but here you go. I think that's, I mean, I think that's a, a little bit of a risky thing to do. I mean, it's at, at the very least, it's very generous. Well, the way I see it is, is actually twofold. So number one, uh, it's something that makes us very unique. Uh, most game publishers do not have their own development staff, so they can't do something like this, and we can't. So, you know, if for most game publishers, uh, if you need a programmer on your game or something like that, uh, they're going to look at you and be like, well, we can't fund you more money, so you're just going to have to go find a partner. And now you have to spend all that time uh. finding a partner, and it's going to be hard, right? Or if they're like, okay, we, do, we can give you more money, so here's some money, go hire your own dude. And that's that's pretty rough too. Like you want to make a game, yeah. you don't want to go like HR and do all that PR stuff or whatever. Um, and it's it's just not it's just not great. And the, the system is pretty clunky when you work with a publisher. And for us, yeah. it's just, it just makes sense because we already have developers uh, and they're already filled in on what the game is. And I can easily just be like, hey, you work on this game today, you work on this game tomorrow, and it's it's just everyday life for these people. And I wonder if it makes your your staff. Um, stick around longer because they just they're having fun right they're working on a variety of different projects from maybe from government work I don't know exactly what client work (laughs) government work all the way over to making a trendy weird game about a boy in a coma you know everything in between yeah I think for for a lot of these people this way they have all sorts of different uh, outlets for creativity you know if they want to do something that's really they can be really like you know brag about it at a family dinner party they can talk about how they worked on like some Paramount Films game or whatever, um, or you know if they want to show it to their indie developer friends, college kids or whatever, they can talk about yeah. something else. Um, and it's just there's a whole variety of work here, and it's never going to get boring around here. So you know you've got this really organic environment where 
you just, you, it seems like you'd make a great parent because you probably wouldn't be a helicopter dad. You'd probably just sort of let your kids grow and become um, civilized individuals and trust them, which it seems you do that with your staff. My question is, does that ever keep you up at night? Like the idea that your staff is, you, you have faith in your staff and, and you don't really nitpick, it, it doesn't seem like you do, you don't nitpick your, your game development staff. Does that keep you up at night at all? <laughs> So, so this is actually something that I realized about myself very recently, um, and uh, it, and that is specifically my leadership uh, style. Um, I realized that my leadership style is this weird, sadistic uh, type of decision making, <laughs> where I literally, I, I intentionally set people up in Serenity Forge uh, to fail on certain things. So, I love that. Yeah. So, like you know, especially <laughs> with our new hires, I love working with our new hires because I get to give them. The, just the most difficult task that I know that they cannot do. Um, and then I would give it to them. And then I can kind of see from afar, like kind of guide them to see like how they're going to do. It's almost like if yeah. you imagine if you have a kid and you just like toss him to a swimming pool and let them swim, right? And I would, yeah. I would stand like most behind a bush. Drown. Yeah, like I would stand behind a bush <laughs> and see how, how they do. And if they're starting to drown, I would run in to kind of pick them up. But if they're not drowning and starting to manage, I'll be like, okay, yeah, yeah that's not bad. Like now I kind of learn a little bit more too. Yeah, well, I had a meeting with my intern today. I just hired an intern, which is a, a big deal for me. I don't have 17 staff members, but I, <laughs> I hired an intern today, and I met with him for lunch, and I told him, I said, I'm going to give you as much as you can possibly handle until you tell me you can't handle it. Um, mainly, the reason why I do it that way is because that's what I would have preferred when I was an intern. I And, and my, my boss handed me a lot, but I wish that they would have handed me more because I, what I'm learning is, and this kind of comes down to self-development is and becoming like the best version of yourself. If, if you, you, you never know exactly what you can handle, especially when you're making a game until you just try it and give it a shot. Um, and so I think, I think your staff will probably respect you for that because you, you, you're showing respect to them. I mean, isn't that a respectful thing to say, Hey, I'm going to give you a ton of work because maybe I think you can handle it. You know? Yeah. I feel like I, I, I do this, purely because I kind of grew up in the same conditions. Um, I, don't, yeah. I don't have any siblings. I, my parents never went to a, a parent-teacher conference. Uh, my parents are very like laissez-faire to let me just like, kind of explore my own things with given, given awesome. some criteria. Um, <laughs> but, but then like uh, for us, it's also kind of culture control within the company because we want this very frantic uh, horizontal leadership stru structure where we can trust each other. Um, yeah. If we hire people, uh, and they just need constant hand holding. No one has the time uh, and to do that. Like it, it's too much time wasted out of our day to do that. We want people who can just, you know, I hire this person and just let them make choices for Serenity Forge. Like they would be making so executive cool. decisions day one, uh, you know, during their work. So, so it doesn't it doesn't really stress you out or keep you up at night. You're you kind of pretty relaxed about it well the, the truth is i kind of set them up with an actual learning curve you know like the projects yeah. that i throw them in the beginning although they're impossible for them they're also not very detrimental to the company a lot of times <laughs> uh and then like eventually uh you uh you know i'll give them more and more bigger tasks and when there are actually important tasks by that time they're kind of trained to to you know so I'll, like have the that first trust. The first task would be like make 300 cups of coffee, you know, <laughs> something that's really pointless but tests their willpower. Uh, I mean, the, the tasks are still pretty big. <laughs> Generally, it's kind of like, oh, this you know, insert uh, very important and well-known company here reached out to us yeah. and want to do a, a collaboration. Uh, do you want to chat with them right. and see if we can strike a deal? Uh, stuff like that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, let me think here if there's any, there's so many questions. I wish I kind of want to have you on in a second segment because you've, you have so much knowledge, um, to bring to the table. And I think, I think right now is probably what I want to do is let's jump right into the, um, hasn't really been 20 minutes yet, but let's jump right into the, um, cheat code section of the podcast. Yeah, but, um, before we do that, is there anything else that you want to mention about your work or, or your studio to maybe let people know about your work and what you guys are doing? Uh, I mean, not necessarily about us per se, but what I want to say is, I mean, you keep on saying that I'm like this expert on stuff. And, you are, dude. And I, I, I feel, I feel a little bit... This podcast is called Game Industry <laughs> Legends. You're a legend. I, I feel a little bit uncomfortable with that considering this, this <laughs> particular fact, and that is... You were 
the influence that got me to become a game developer. I, I think that's really important for me to, to say in, on, on this stage right here. Can I, I be honest with you about something? Yeah, sure, go ahead. You've been telling me that for two years, and I always assumed you were lying. No, no. Because, okay. because I, I thought you were like, just wanted me to sign a contract. You know, because I always assume the worst in people. I'm, a, I'm, that kind of, <laughs> I'm that kind of person, especially when there's a contract involved. But, dude, that means the world to me. Thank you. I mean, I don't know why you would say that, though. But, yeah. I, um, so, so, Coma, the original Flash game, I forced all of my friends to play that game. Anyone who joins Serenity <laughs> Forge is required to play that game. It's just, it's just one of those things that for the past more than 10 years now, uh, that like, it, it's a game that we, we cared about as a team. Like right. I, I remember just you know uh, just loving it so much. Uh, the fir- very first game that I personally actually designed was a two D platformer horror game, a psychological horror game, and oh, and cool. that goes yeah that just goes to show how much influence you had on me as a human being, way before you even knew that I existed. Well, thanks, dude. That means a lot to me. Um, yeah, that's it's crazy that it's been almost a decade since um, Coma was Coma was released in two thousand. Uh, yeah. Nine, I think. Well, that, yeah. Um, wouldn't it be cool if we released Once Upon a Coma at the anniversary? Oh, that would be. You need to tell Let's, me what day it is. Yeah, we need to talk about that after this call. That could that could be really cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, okay, so guys, that's the podcast. The next section of the podcast is the most valuable portion of the podcast. However, you have to pay for it. Sorry. Um, and that is on Patreon. Become a patron supporter or a, a Patreon patron. Um, for I think it's like 10 bucks a month um, and you can get the next section and the next section is called cheat codes and this is a really valuable section of the podcast because this is where Z is he's written these he's planned these these secrets out and these are these are game industry secrets that a lot of us uh, took a long time to figure out I'm sure it took Z a long time to figure these things out Um, but he's just going to give it to you um, just really quickly um, in bullet points and that's incredibly important because most of us have to work really hard to learn that stuff. So um, thanks for watching the podcast, listening to the podcast. Please subscribe, hit the like button, um, share this podcast if you want to hear more. Um, Again, my name is Thomas Brush and I had Z from Serenity Forge with me. Um, So thanks for watching guys. See you later. All right. So this section of the podcast is called uh, Cheat Codes. Z, did you write three cheat codes for the podcast? Yes, I did. All right, so let's just uh, jump into that first cheat code, man. What is it? All right, and that is...